whether from a living donor or the gift of life from the tragedy of a stranger, transplants can restore a recipient's life. Medical transplanting options tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. On December 23rd, 1954, the first successful living related kidney transplant was performed at Brigham Hospital in Boston by a team led by Dr. Joseph Murray and Dr. David Hume. Then in 1962, the same team of doctors did the first successful kidney transplant from a deceased donor. Since that time, Transplants have become more common and extensive. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. What percentage of kidney transplants come from living donors? 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We will answer your medical questions about transplant throughout the show, and those options are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. So do that, call in your questions, make it your show. Let's hear those questions. Come in, 1-888 3766225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us in the studio tonight is Dr. Robert Santella, nephrology and transplant of Vera Medical Group, Sioux Falls, and Dr. Jeff Steer, Steers, a Vera Medical Group transplant and liver trans, uh, surgery renal transplant team. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. It's our pleasure. Our pleasure. So, Bob, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience. What, what's a nephrologist? That's a kidney doc, so I deal with patients with high blood pressure, kidney failure, kidney disease, dialysis, which is one treatment for kidney failure, and the ultimate treatment for kidney failure, transplant. And you're originally from Massachusetts? Connecticut. Connecticut. But been all over the East Coast. And you did your training? <clears throat> Went to med school at uh, Creighton in Omaha. That's where I met my wife. We went back to the East Coast for 10 years for training, and then I worked at Columbia for three years, and then we decided this was the place to be. So uh, closer to her home, actually. Right, right. So 24, 24 years ago, we came back. Oh, and have you, you, you like being back to South uh, Dakota? Delighted. It's a great delighted. place. Yeah. And Jeff, tell us a little bit about uh, you. Are you from where originally? I grew up in Kansas, lived there my whole life. I uh, went to medical school and residency at the University of Kansas in Kansas City, um, and then Mayo for a number of years. Um, I worked both in Rochester and Jacksonville, Florida. Um, got to know South Dakota a bit from working in Rochester and traveling over here to South Dakota often. Um, and then an opportunity came, and I was excited to be able to come join the team at Avera. So at Avera, we are doing kidney and liver transplants. And pancreas. And pancreas transplants. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about how those are done or what's happening with that in the distribution. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about pancreatic cancer, uh, uh, <coughs> transplants um, uh, for diabetes. Are we getting that uh, to a point where that's a successful thing or is it done in block or, you know, tell me about it. Well, pancreas transplants for type 1 diabetics have been done for a long time. I, I've personally done them since uh, the late 1980s. Um, they're very successful for the right patients. Most are done in combination with a kidney transplant for patients who have renal failure from diabetes. Um, we can do them for type 2 patients as well, patients who are using insulin and have kidney failure. Um, and the results are very good when appropriate patients are selected and the procedure goes well and um, no immediate complications. Uh, we do some patients who have type 1 diabetes um, without a kidney transplant, so for patients who have very difficult to control diabetes where they're in the hospital frequently for complications from their diabetes. Uh, a few of those patients are candidates for pancreas transplants alone. Right. Uh, we can do pancreas transplants in combination with kidneys. We have 
a patient listed for a liver and a pancreas who has type 1 diabetes and liver disease. So uh, the types of organs uh, patients are candidates for depends on what their diseases are right. and how we can best help them. Of the pancreatic can uh, uh, transplants, how many of them are done with the kidney as well? Most of them are done with, with kidneys. Uh, some of them can be done after a successful kidney transplant, so a patient is approaching dialysis or on dialysis and they have a living donor, they can get a, a, mm -hmm. a donor trans, living donor kidney transplant and then a pancreas can be done afterwards. That's a pancreas after kidney transplant. So right. that's, uh, they're simultaneous kidney and pancreas at the same time or a pancreas after kidney would be the most common. Pancreas transplants alone are, are much less common, probably 5% of the transplants done around the country. Kidney transplants, the, the big one though, I mean that was the first transplant. The largest numbers, yeah. Right. And uh, of the people who have kidney disease, what, what percentage need to go eventually to kidney transplant? That's a good question. I, I would say that probably, well, there are about th th 350,000 people on dialysis and we do about 16,000 kidney transplants a year. So you could do the math. We have a, sh you know, there's 100,000 people waiting for kidneys and we get to do 16,000 a year. So the list keeps growing. Because so that's, a, that's sort of a tragedy in our country, isn't absolutely. it? That, that there for are 100,000 people looking for a kidney and mm -hmm. there's 16,000 that get it once a year. And there are more coming down the pike who are gonna go into renal failure. What, are, what would be the major reasons why people go into kidney renal failure? So about half are di due to diabetes. Most are type two diabetes, but a significant portion type one diabetes. So that's about half of all the kidney failure. Right. And then high blood pressure gets blamed for maybe another quarter, but it's, the problem's the chicken or the egg because kidney failure causes high blood pressure, high blood pressure causes kidney failure, so it's difficult. I think we blame high blood pressure and a, as a, a little more, and, and some I think we don't know the cause for some. Right. But there's hereditary diseases like polycystic kidney disease, um, some you know kidney cancer, you, one kidney's been removed and the patient has high blood pressure and gets kidney failure, and there's a number of metabolic diseases. Right. Sometimes we don't really know. <clears throat> Oftentimes the people present too late. So even if we do a kidney biopsy, it's all scar and we don't know why. Yeah. So, well, there's all this thing about cost. I mean, one of the things that uh, people talk about is the amount of money that uh, the U.S. is spending on health care. And that's, that's going to be more highlighted as time goes by. But the, qu the question is going to be um, the cost of it. And now there's that arguable thing, well, what's the cost of dialysis? So to ex put that out there, what is the difference between the cost of dialysis versus the cost of the transplant? So dialysis is expensive. Um, and the cost of the transplant up front is expensive. But the cost curves cross at uh, about two years. So, so after you live two, more than two years with the transplant, you've saved money. Which everybody does, <laughs> barring a catastrophe. Um, so you've, you're saving money for sure. It, 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 the patient feels better. It's easier. The patient definitely lives longer. Dialysis, uh, well, transplant will double or triple a life expectancy and then it's, it's cheaper beyond the second year. Yeah. And for liver, I suspect it might be similar. Taking care of an end-stage liver disease patient is pretty expensive. So, Yeah, as, as liver transplant became more readily available, uh, those exact analyses were, done, analyses were done for the cost of dying of liver failure in the United States. All the hospitalizations, all the medicines, all the procedures, sometimes people dying over the course of three years from liver disease, uh, and the cost-benefit analysis was done to show that liver transplants actually cheaper oftentimes than dying of liver failure slowly. Uh, I mean, that's, and that's not a happy dying process no. with bleeding as a rule. So I, we, we're talking about uh, what we can do to encourage um, uh, transplants to occur. I mean, there's the, all these people who, who are without uh, access and certainly more cadavers are probably not available. I mean, have we used... Well, there are some tricks to try to, I shouldn't say tricks, but uh, procedures. We're now using, uh, it's a complicated explanation, but we're now using, most donors have brain death. The, the, the injury 
the accident. Yeah, the motorcycle but, head trauma. <clears throat> right. But their kidneys are still alive and you the can... The heart is pumping and then Dr. Sears takes out the kidney while the heart is still supplying blood. But now we've gone beyond that and there are patients who are not brain dead who have, but have severe injuries, the family decides to withdraw life support and to, we wait till the heart stops, circulatory death. And those maybe 10, 15 years ago were rarely used and now we use them more. We're using more older donors. We're using more what we would consider in the past high risk donors. So we're doing so our best. So we're moving the curve a little bit for cadaver, but the answer I think is more, more in my mind, more living donors. Right, for kidney, especially <coughs> the, uh, uh, we, have kidney, yeah. in, we have incrementally increased the number of cadaver donors, but small increments. Right. By adding all the high risk donors, donors after circulatory death, more marginal donors, older donors, it moves the bar a little bit, but it doesn't make massive gains in the number of potential donors available. Um, there are there's still some room to improve the donation rates where the families are willing to donate. Uh, even in patients uh, nationally, it you know, varies from 40 to 60, 70 percent of people will donate after their loved one has become a potential donor. It's actually pretty good in our in the Midwest. Some parts of the country, it's not as, not good. as good, and that's what uh, leads to long waiting times. Uh, certainly, for living donors for kidneys, um, we are very, I think, aggressive about anyone who's whose life we wouldn't put at significant risk to use them as a living donor, we will consider. Our preserving the health and the safety of the donor has to be the number one concern, though. Right. And let's talk about that more in just a minute. When you discover that you are in need of a transplant, an active approach to moving the process forward can be life-saving. I saw that he was losing weight, which didn't alarm me at first, but it was the night sweats that alarmed me the most, I think, because they were really unusual, not normal. And he didn't go for regular checkups. I don't think guys do as often as they should. I think women are probably more aware of taking care of themselves and going for annual checkups. So I convinced him that he needed to go in and see the doctor um, because something just wasn't right. So when he came home that night and said, Dr. Holmes says there's something wrong with my liver, I just said, liver how can there be something wrong with your liver this was such unexpected news and so out of i don't know out of the blue they told him that he had a disease that would run its course in about 10 years and that it was fatal if he didn't have a transplant waiting for a liver transplant uh, from a deceased donor is what we thought well, yeah. and then as it came out uh, they they recommended that we consider a living donor. So I sent a letter to friends and family just explaining the situation and that if they were at all interested, they should contact Rochester Mayo Clinic, not us, that we wouldn't have any part of this. Um, they would do this all on their own. I was just amazed at the generosity and um, bravery of these people who would step forward and say that they were willing to go through a surgery like this. And uh, we just would say, I mean, if this is really something you want to do, call this number. And I think several people did. But a few months later, I got a call from my aunt saying, we think we have a liver for you. And it turned out that it was my cousin. She was going to Mayo and going through the testing process. And when she knew that she was going to be chosen, she didn't call us, her mother did, and said, we have a liver for you. I don't think until it was over we fully realized what she had done for us. About 10 years passed and every year I'd go back for an annual or some other procedure and eventually my kidneys got bad enough that um, they said you're either have, going to have to go on dialysis or you'll need another, you'll need a transplant. So again... Oh, I wrote a letter again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Went back on the national list for kidney transplant and they said it would be probably about two years and therefore you probably will end up on dialysis if you wait for a kidney. And my cousin Pete is the one who called and said, I'm the winner, I get to give you a kidney. <laughs> I'm a very blessed person to um, have had two generous people and a lot of prayers and a lot of other folks so many out people. there yeah. um, that have 
been pulling for us and we've survived it all and uh, if you ask me how I felt today I, I'm feeling great life continues you know through organ transplantation um, people can reclaim their lives and go on to leave a nor lead a normal life it's just a, a matter of you know people thinking put that D on your driver's license for sure Nobody, you know, hopes for a tragic thing to happen, but we hear of tragedies all the time. And if, if by something uh, as tragic as an accident would happen, that parts of you, uh, you could give the gift of life to someone else. Well, we thank them for willingness to, to share that information. Of course, it was just a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was summertime during that interview. <laughs> it was a little while ago. Thank you so much for doing that for us. We've been waiting for this show to put that on air. Bob, tell us a little bit about the risk that it might be to the person who's donating a kidney. Uh, I mean, how big of a risk is that? And uh, well, the risk can never be zero. If you have your gallbladder out, you have a risk of dying from a mishap for a, just a fluke from anesthesia. So the risk is never zero, but it's quite, quite low. And if we look at it objectively, um, statistically, there's a small risk, but that risk, it, if the person is screened properly, does not smoke, does not have high blood pressure, no risk of elevated glucose, et cetera, a very healthy individual. It's in the area, the, the risk of kidney failure for the rest of their lives is in the one, two, three out of a thousand. Um, and you know, there's a general risk of all of us of developing kidney well, failure. And, and, and if you look at the, the very small percentage of people that do develop it, they on average develop it many years later. The idea being that they have one kidney and maybe they develop diabetes 10 years later and then they're a little bit uh, at higher risk because they have one kidney. But the, the risk, and, and we have to remember these are people donating, you know, it would be me donating to my daughter or my wife. And so I would take tremendous risk and the risk is actually so quite Very small. Sure. Yeah. I think about uh, <coughs> Jim Abbott, uh, the dean mm -hmm. of the, sure. uh, the US, well, the president of USD who donated to one of his teachers, mm -hmm. you know, his college professors. I mean, what a hero thing to do. Uh, so uh, that, to me, is uh, a real gift for someone to do that. I think it's, yes. it, 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 the absolute risk is low, but not zero. And then you have to look at the desire to donate. The, there is benefit to the donor. Yeah. Well, and of course, you know, we all gain when we give, don't we? I mean, we really do. My point. Exactly your point. What about the longest person? How long do they live when you get a transplanted kidney? I mean, do they last uh, as long as a normal kidney? Or what's, what's the number of um, uh, kidney transplant years? Well, over the course of time, the kidneys can fail, but barring episodes of rejection and, and other medical complications, most of them can last many years. Some of them last 20 or 30 years, depending on the quality of the organ and how healthy the recipient is. Obviously, we see uh, older patients now coming in for transplant evaluations. If you're 60, 70 years old, uh, the kidney we put in you may not last 30 years. Right, right. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the children we transplant, the, the people that are in their 20s when we transplant them, can live normal lives. Uh, it's the first few years when things are likely to have uh, issues that can arise, but after that, it's usually the, the life expectancy of the kidney is usually very good. I had a patient who had a, a brother trans, uh, donate his kidney 35 years earlier, and I, and I cared for her in the last 10 years of her life. And her only major problem was that she had um, uh, skin cancers because she had the immune system turned off and the skin cancers were popping up. And I think she eventually died in her mid-80s. Her brother died before her of another problem totally unrelated to kidney donation. And I think about the wonderful life that that man did. I just, I, 35 years. 
So um, we have a question. What has the, been the longest person is uh, living after a kidney transplant, and what's the average length? And so that's. Well, there are still people transplanted in the 60s, the last I heard, that are still doing okay. Um, well, the 1954 <coughs> twins died not too long ago. The, the, the recipient. The, the, the original yeah. twins? It wasn't that long ago. Right. Within the last 10, ten years, years yeah. less than 10 years ago. That was before so, we had reje anti-rejection drugs. They just right. transplanted a twin. Right, and the ones we have today, you were talking about skin cancers. <coughs> the medications we use today, and Bob can elaborate, are so much better than the drugs we used even 15, 20 years ago. The quality of life people experience today, um, I, I, I'm still shocked at times when I see people on the street or playing tennis or golf with, and they tell me they had a transplant 20 years ago. You would never know until they tell you that they had one. Uh, they, and the medicines are so much better today. Well, that gentleman who had a liver and then a kidney transplant that was uh, with his wife on that Roland that we had earlier, I mean, He's a normal guy. I mean, you know, he was the head coach of SDSU. Um, and, uh, of course, illness changed some things, but he has stayed active his whole life, a normal person. You know, except for his rather strange personality. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, let's do a telestrator opportunity. I would like to uh, talk about liver just a little bit. Here's a picture of a liver. Um, what are the reasons a person can have liver problems? Well, the uh, obvious uh, most common cause is cirrhosis of the liver. This shows the stages of fibrosis leading to cirrhosis. So this is the cirrhotic liver here. And cirrhosis technically just means scarring in the liver. It's the same thing we see in kidneys when kidneys fail. You just see scar tissue. It replaces the tissue of the liver. And in the liver, one of the bigger challenges is the scar tissue and keeps blood from flowing through the liver the way it should. Uh, as, as scar tissue builds up, the blood starts to back up in the portal vein uh, and then in the abdomen, and so the belly fills up with fluid. We call that ascites. Um, blood starts to back up in the intestinal tract. People can bleed from varices, just enlarged veins, um, and that's one of the bigger complications. Eventually, cirrhosis can lead to cancer in the liver, uh, and, it, and it can also lead to renal syndrome, which is basically kidney failure caused by the liver not working. Right. All of those things can be cured with a liver transplant. Right. So causes of cirrhosis, let's talk about that because that's, that's, uh, uh, that's the big question that we're looking at right now. Um, there are several causes. The biggest one would be? Well, in the United States, alcohol uh, would, would probably be number one. Uh, the exact number of people whose liver disease is caused by alcohol is hard because um, almost everybody, well, the majority of Americans drink some. Uh, very few people don't drink at all any alcohol. Uh, so if they have any other potential contributing causes of liver disease, such as <clears throat> hepatitis C, autoimmune hepatitis, uh, any genetic liver diseases, alcohol can add on top of that. So attributing exactly how many are from alcohol is, is challenging, but the most common causes of cirrhosis in the United States are hepatitis C, although that's diminishing over time, alcohol, and then what we call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You just hear people, I have a fatty liver. That's, yeah. the, that, that's the second most common now. Of cirrhosis. Of cirrhosis. Talk to, talk to me about that, Bob. Uh, fatty liver uh, <coughs> uh, disease, uh, cirrhosis from overweight? Yes, but not everybody with a fatty liver is fat, surprisingly. Uh, so metabolic derangements, uh, uh, the metabolic syndrome. Uh, That's the or, diabetes, obesity, and uh, lipid abnormalities. Lipid but many are obese. I mean, obesity is a problem. There's no question about it. But right. I mean, I, and right had, now in the country, there is an epidemic sure. of obesity. Sure. Are we going to have an epidemic of cirrhosis from That's the fatty prediction. liver? The prediction is because the hepatitis C drugs are so good. Now, nearly 100%, hepatitis C is nearly 100% curable, that that curve's going down, and then the fatty liver curve's going up, and I don't know, alcohol's steady. Pretty steady. Pretty steady. <laughs> I, I looked up today that there's like three and a half million people in the United States with hepatitis C and about 10%, maybe 20% can get cirrhosis. But overall, uh, less than 5% of the hepatitis C patients will get 
cancer. I mean, and, and the point I'm, I skipped was that cirrhosis can also bring cancer of the liver. Mm -hmm. And that's the big push people are going for the hepatitis C. Right. Some would argue it's a very expensive thing. It, it can be. Um, <clears throat> but like we've talked about, dying of cirrhosis is very expensive as well. Uh, when we talk about fatty liver, the other thing to keep in mind is when we do organ procurements for livers, uh, one of the things we have to look for is how much fat is in the donor liver. There are people who are 18 years old at, that have 50 percent of their liver replaced with fat and we wow. can't use those for transplant but it's shocking how many young younger healthier people have, have a lot of fat in them. their liver now and what's going to happen to them in 30 or 40 years yeah. uh, they may well have cirrhosis and pancreas I mean right. one of the problems with pancreas transplant is we can't get the organs and how many times you've gone out and it's just too fatty can't use it fatty pancreas mm -hmm. common. Yeah. very very common, common. So um, let's say that uh, I get a fatty uh, liver transplant from somebody who, and I'm desperate, so I'll take the fatty one because I'm dying of liver disease, okay? Will that fat go away uh, living in me that doesn't have a liver? Do you have an answer? Doesn't have fatty liver? It, so there are general guidelines about how much fat is acceptable in a donor liver. Uh, the problem with fat in the donor liver is that the fat when it's put on ice tends to freeze in a different way and then when you recirculate when you connect it to the recipient when the new warm blood goes through there the every cell that contains a significant a large globule of fat that cell dies so if 50 percent of the uh -huh. liver cells have fat in them of that size and they all die then the day after the transplant half of the new liver you got is dead yeah so as a general rule we limit it to about 30 percent any more than 30 percent sometimes 40 um, that's we, we don't use it now uh, the and the problem is if we use those uh, the real risk is that if the liver fails then you need another transplant generally within days to a week and if you don't you're, you gone. you're gone yeah right so we can't that's one thing we can't uh, fudge too much with how much fat is in the liver. You know, it's interesting. The more we get into this, the more complicated it seems, Jeff. What is this? It is. <laughs> it seemed easier when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the beginning of, of, um, of uh, transplants and what we ran into. But I'm, I would ask you to realize that this is your show. Your questions are key to the show discussion. Call in your questions about transplants to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Uh, so this is an important uh, deal. We need your questions. And uh, I, I love the issue about uh, where we first thought we could transplant organs and we ran into some trouble. Uh, what, what's the story there? Well, you know, when we started in this 20, 30 years ago, um, the donors we used had to be perfect. I mean, we didn't cut corners. Uh, we wouldn't, I still remember the first time we used a donor for a liver that was 60 years of age or older. Uh, I, you would have thought we were crossing into un unknown frontiers. Yes. Uh, you know, and then as more and more people die or stay on dialysis for longer periods of time, you end up trying to push the limits so that you can take care of these patients. Um, and then until something bad happens, you don't know where that limit is. Certainly today, we're using cadaver donor livers that we would have never even considered before. before. Um, we're, and, kidneys. and kidneys are the same way. And another problem that we see, uh, I would say for our cadaver donor uh, pool of organs, more and more people dying of heroin and drug overdoses. Um, and historically, we wouldn't use a lot of those, and today it's a sizable population. So we're getting more donation from the narcotic abuse. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Right. That's, that's, that's a sad, sad story. It's very sad. Yeah. Very sad. When you receive a transplant from a live donor, it may create a connection you never expected. A couple summers ago, I, I uh, was coming down with symptoms that I thought were flu-like and, and maybe West Nile-like, uh, lack of appetite and, and uh, lack of uh, stamina, and motivation, and energy. And I started running some tests and figured out that, that uh, through it all, I ended up having been diagnosed with kidney disease. 
Um, more specifically, I, I'm told it's IgA nephropathy. I was put on the transplant list uh, right away uh, when they diagnosed it. And, and, uh, um, but then consequently, I, if you get infections, then you're taken off and on and that kind of thing until your infections heal up. And so you're kind of on. The, uh, they don't really tell you where you're at on the list. They just look for donors and, and uh, the right matches. So My coworkers at the school, I'm the superintendent and, and high school principal, and had gotten together and watched me start to struggle through this with doctor's appointments and energy throughout the day. And they decided to have kind of a rally to make people aware of uh, not just my situation, but the importance of being organ donors. Uh, Kelloland did a special at the Howard School. They kind of had, I guess, a rally. And I had watched the clip online and heard about it. Yeah, and they had given information if you wanted to donate or were interested in getting tested for donation. So. I called right away and started the process. Uh, the first thing was a phone interview, um, just asking medical background, family background, and then I did have to do some labs right away, um, blood tests and urine tests, uh, send in all my records from the past eight years. And that part was a really long process. And then Following that, I went to Sioux Falls for two days of testing, medical and um, some psychological examinations. Uh, I found out that I could be a direct match to him um, after about two and a half months of testing. And at that point, I could either be a direct match to Mr. Cullen or I could do the paired exchange and be a match to somebody else and then he would still receive a kidney from somebody else. She had uh, told me that you know we were, we were talking about it and I said, you know, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to give a kidney to an old guy? You know, you're, you're a young lady, you're not married, you haven't had any children, you've got your whole life ahead of you. And she, without hesitation, just said, yes, I want to do this. When I started the process, I honestly thought my parents would not be pleased with it, but it's amazing the encouragement they've given me and um, they haven't discouraged me at all. Uh, she's giving me a great gift that I can't find the words to say thank you enough for, um, to, to change the quality of my life for my family. And so she's having an impact not only on her family, and, and, but mine as well. I just love that story. I mean, it was, she was his student. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful story? Uh, I, I, uh, Wait, yeah. Just for one second. Sure. There's a lot of um, church people. Oh, I've noticed that, 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 that donors, either fellow parishioners or pastor, parishioner, that's not uncommon. Uh, so I, I, my hat's off to the people who are the heroes like that. I mean, that's a gift. That's a real gift of life. I, I wanted to, uh, uh, to mention that uh, there's some rumor that there are less cadavers available for doning, donation because of the th car safety uh, has improved. Do we know those numbers? I, I, don't, I don't have an exact number. Uh, I think there are fewer car accident victims um, overall. Uh, but. It's probably balanced out an equal number by people who the, were using donors that are older who had strokes and other medical problems that we wouldn't have considered as potential donors in the past. Overall, the number of cadaver donors numbers have stayed about the same. Oh, okay. uh, but there are now an increased risk from uh, we're seeing more and more donors who are opiate addicts who have overdosed. Yeah. So I would say gunshots and heroin overdose exceed the, you right. know, the, uh, the opposite with, with the cars. Uh, yeah. Automobile crashes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the uh, lectures that I remember listening to 15 years ago was from a, a physician who was uh, donating or who was transplanting kidneys from infants or babies or young children who you know were cadavers from a, a car accidents or whatever it might be into adults and they were, they were finding success. What, how does that go? It's great, it's fantastic. It's not that common, but those kidneys grow amazingly. A kidney is the size of a walnut that in three to six months will be normal size. Right, well and thankfully there aren't that many infant donors, 
uh, right. because it's very emotional and, and uh, difficult. But the kidneys work fine and they will grow over time. The same thing is true for livers. We'll put small donor livers in adults and they will get bigger over time and provide full function. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Um, so you know, just a small person who has a small kidney and into a big person and it works. Well, ideally, I think if we'd all want the biggest kidney we could get. Yeah. Well, the, more, <laughs> the more kidney function you have, the better. Um, but certainly in the case of a living you donor. No, no, yeah. no. I, I would take it, but it just probably wouldn't last as long as I'd like. <laughs> I, I, might, I might need both. <laughs> I'd take either apart. one of your kidneys, yeah. actually. But um, uh, over the course of time, uh, you know, small, the smaller organs will grow and, and they work great. Depends on the age of the donor, though. I mean, kidneys yeah. do age. We were talking about that earlier with the students. The kidneys yes. age, so a baby, an infant kidney, will grow. And live in, for a long, long time. Right. Or if you had a 70-year-old kidney. It's not going to grow. Yeah, a 50-year-old kidney is not going to grow. And will they, will they have a timeline and, and, and uh, fail? Uh, sure. The the younger, the healthier the donor, the better the, 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 the better, better the kidney. Yeah. Is, the is, better longevity. Is that the same with liver transplant? Not really. Uh, uh, an older liver can work just as well as a younger liver. We don't uh, exclude older donors cadaver for living for liver transplant, um, with the exception of donors uh, recipients who have hepatitis C. Uh, older livers are not able to fight off hepatitis C as well, so uh, when we expanded our donor criteria from less than 60 to even up to 90 years of age, the one thing we did see that is those patients who had hepatitis C, <laughs> the virus came back much more aggressively in the donor liver. Uh, today, so if a normal donor liver into a person with hepatitis, hepatitis C, C it didn't work well? Right, it didn't fight off the hepatitis C. There was actually, for every 10 years, the risk of progression of liver disease to liver failure went up st statistically significant. So a 10-year-old liver was better than a 20-year-old liver, and that was better than a 30 or a 40 or a 50. Uh, that became a problem 10 or 15 years ago when we started using older donors. Today, though, now, hepatitis C can be treated, so most people don't worry about it anymore. So an 80-year-old liver, as long as they're healthy, should work fine. Talk to us a little bit about hepatitis C, Bob. Uh, you know, who gets it? Why is it spread? Uh, how do you prevent getting it? And then what about the treatment? How much it costs? Well, the, 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 it's, it's, it's a blood-borne disease. So years ago, blood transfusions, IV drug use. And so it's a disease that takes many years to manifest itself. So it's a disease that started in the past and is manifesting now. And what we think will just go away. Um, you should have a hepatologist on someday. That that yes. be interesting. And it's, you think it'll go away? Explain that. I mean, what do you mean? Well, because it's ninety-seven to one hundred percent curable. And so with you're twelve not, nobody's weeks, spreading it. With twelve weeks, of, well, the, the IV drug users now seem to have a new pool <laughs> right. because of spread of needles. So thing. all this narcotic that so that starts with oxycodone and then goes to heroin. We're seeing hepatitis C in those people, but eventually, I think we'll, we'll, you know, there's been a big push to target that. We'll target that, and then we'll be able to and prevent the spread of hepatitis C. C. And the cost will come down. It is very expensive. 80000 a year to treat. Yeah. Well, and, one time. Right. Well, 12 right. weeks of therapy. But it, it, you're cured. Right. If you take your pills. Right. right. And if you have access to the pills. But there was a big um, pool of patients who had hepatitis C who didn't know it, the baby boomers who yeah. used IV drugs or did tattoos or piercings in the 1960s and 70s before it was really known what hepatitis C was. That pool is now kind of uh, being eliminated. Uh, they're either being treated or they're being found that need a transplant or something else. But now we are seeing kind of a resurgence of younger people using IV drugs, sharing needles, and getting fresh cases of hepatitis C. And so if we left them alone, a percentage of them wouldn't go on to cirrhosis, and a percentage of them, uh, and, and the majority of them, would not have problems. Now, if I had it, I'd want, I'd want the treatment. Would you please give it to me? But the, the, let's say that the people that have hepatitis C are all Medicaid patients in the, in the, in the jails and uh, our society, and how much is, how is Medicaid doing right now? Not very well, I mean, financially, there's a lot of people who are struggling, and this is a huge amount of money. Um, I present that ethical dilemma to you, gentlemen. What is the answer there? Well, 
first, only about 30% of hepatitis C is spontaneously cleared. So about 70% are going to have Cirrhosis. continued active, active hepatitis C. If they live long enough, in 10, 15 years, they're going to get cirrhosis. In another 5, 10 years, you know, not everybody gets cancer, but a, a lot do. Um, difficult dilemma. I think the price will come down of the drugs. And, um, you know, I think in general, we have to look at cost-effective measures. And it's definitely cheaper to spend 10, 10 to 80,000 depending it's going to be 80 it's 80,000 now but you know the drug cost is going to come down it's a lot cheaper to spend 80,000 now than to take pay people through cirrhosis yeah. liver cancer right but the other <coughs> part of the equation is the cost of the medicine why does it cost $80,000 yeah, to, to have the medicine yeah, that's a that's a policy <laughs> show right. we're going to talk political <laughs> issues and so <laughs> we've got 12 questions uh, my 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 Thing wasn't working, so I didn't realize we had questions. We appreciate your questions. Thank you. Explain peritoneal dialysis. What is peritoneal dialysis? What is the hematologic dialysis? So there's two kinds of dialysis. Dialysis is cleaning the blood from kidney failure. There's right. two kinds. There's so it's artificial kidney function treatment. Right. So there's hemodialysis or blood dialysis. That's where the blood comes out of your, usually your arm, goes through a machine, gets filtered, comes back into you, and you need that treatment four hours, three times a week at the hospital or five days a week for a shorter period of time at home. Peritoneal dialysis is a completely different concept, equally as effective. A uh, tube is put in the abdomen so the inside of the tube is underneath the skin and muscle outside the bowel and you put changing your oil you, as a way to look at it you put clean fluid in it sits in for a while and you take clean and you take dirty fluid out clean fluid in dirty fluid out and you can do that various ways at home it's done at home and there's some people who say that it, a it's less expensive and b it it works better it, it, the, it's about the same. I mean, it works better for some individuals because we can set up a machine at home to do it at night and they can work and it works better for their lifestyle, but the life expectancies are the same and the outcomes are the same. Okay. Yeah. And I, it, it, is, it, is, it is a little bit cheaper for the government who pays for dialysis. Okay. The individual wouldn't see that. Now, if a person, here's another question about dialysis, a person who is 50 years of age goes on dialysis, do they live a normal lifetime or does it cause advanced aging process? Well, well, kidney failure um, markedly decreases life expectancy. So the average life expectancy on dialysis it, either way is? It's, it depends on the age that you start, where you have diabetes or not. So if you have a, if there's a, if a type 1 diabetic have a, has an average life expectancy of five years on dialysis. Okay. If, and, uh, if with a transplant? Uh, 15 if they're a 30 year old. You do a pancreas. 15, 20, well I shouldn't say yeah. 20 years if you do a kidney pancreas, 20, right. 30 years, yeah. you know. Um, but an older patient starting dialysis or an older diabetic uh, would have an equally low life ex expectancy, but a middle okay. aged non diabetic can live 10 years on dialysis. But right. the other problem with that is if, <clears throat> if you're diabetic waiting for a cadaver kidney, and your life expectancy is five years or less, and the waiting time is six or seven years. There you go. You miss it. it. Right. There's a window. Right. The window. The window gets closed. It's closed. Please explain polycystic kidney disease. Bob? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> it's a genetic disease. It's autosomal dominant, so it's inherited. 50% uh, of children are affected. It causes the uh, cysts to grow in the kidney. The cysts are fluid-filled pouches. They grow and they squeeze out the normal kidney, cause kidney failure. So someone who has polycystic kidney disease, uh, most patients will get kidney failure. Yeah, it's a genetic, I mean, if you've got it in your family history, is it 100% you're gonna get it? 50% 50, 50 of, if you have polycystic kidney disease, 50% of your children will have polycystic kidney disease. And it can't affect the liver, so we see patients who need a liver and a kidney transplant because for of polycystic. Because of all of the cysts of the, of right. the liver, too. Right. But it's it much more common to affect the kidneys right. than the liver. Right. Okay. Is it possible to perform a pancreas transplant on pancreatic cancer patients whose cancer has metastasized or whose cancer has not metastasized? The pancreas transplants are indicated for treatment of diabetes, not, uh, not, not for cancer. cancer. Right. Okay. So most patients that we operate on for pancreatic cancer um, can be managed. A lot of them don't even become diabetics um, if they have enough pancreas left over. 
uh, they can still manage their insulin and glucose. Okay. Explain how high blood pressure can damage the kidney in, in five <coughs> words or less. Kidneys are made of blood vessels. High blood pressure hurts blood vessels. Very good. But we don't know that that, and like you said earlier so eloquently, chicken or the egg. Maybe the high blood pressure caused the kidneys to fail, or maybe the kidneys are failing and it caused the high blood pressure. Again, everything's a degree. So if someone's walking around with blood pressure of 200 over 120, that's likely to cause kidney disease. So I have a creatinine that is twice normal because I have a blood pressure of 200 over 100 and you lower my blood pressure to normal, what's my creatinine, my, my kidney uh, indicator going to do? So if, if, if your blood pressures were very high, you can have some acute kidney damage that can get better. And in it, but more commonly, if there's enough scarring from high blood pressure and you lower the blood pressure, then the kidney will stabilize and last much longer with better blood pressure. Right, even though the creatinine climbs. See, and that's what patients fear because they see that creatinine climbing, which is an indicator of renal failure, you, you and can, they go. You can push kid, ultimate kidney failure way off by controlling blood pressure. Control that blood pressure. That's an important lesson, you know. If a breast cancer survivor who had a chemo and radiation wanted to donate as an organ donor, would they, could they, should they? <clears throat> there are some cancers that we can uh, use donors after they've had cancer. Now, for living donors, uh, <clears throat> we would be very skeptical. I think some of the cancers, breast cancer being one of them, uh, even after years of having no evidence of recurrence, uh, you can see patients who come back 10, 15, 20 years later with recurrence of the cancer. Okay. Uh, melanoma is another one. So, yeah. so those Sneaky. kinds of cancers we, we just really don't use. Uh, there are some cancers, though, that are that are very low grade that can be cured. Okay. Uh, and and that's a case by case basis. Breast cancer is much less likely to be a potential donor, either living or cadaver. Okay. Ten seconds. Any final thoughts or words that you want to say right now on that? Okay. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question: What percentage of kidney transplants come from living donors? Twenty percent? Forty? Sixty? Eighty? The correct answer is 40%, and it was Margaret Apple from Aberdeen who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Margaret, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon if we have your address, and unfortunately, we didn't get your address, so please call us back, 1-888-376-6225, and give us your address again so we can get that book to you. We'll be right back after this. Good day, citizens. It is with regret that I inform you that the end is near for me. I'm old, I'm tired, I'm weak. But don't go thinking that you've won the war against the flu. Before I go to that big petri dish in the sky, I will find a suitable replacement. Be warned. Back in the mid-70s, I spent several months as a student on the kidney ward in an Atlanta teaching hospital. I remember at the time this hospital had only a limited number of artificial kidney dialysis machines and were just beginning to transplant kidneys. I asked some friends in South Dakota what they knew about transplant programs and one said, you should always use starter fertilizer or a small dose of manure or organic compost and then water and sunlight does the rest. The word transplant in South Dakota usually refers to plants, not organs. The dream of transplanting a functioning organ from one person into someone with a failed kidney has been around for many years. In 1902, an Austrian animal experiment showed transplanted kidneys failed after a few days due to some unknown biochemical barrier. And for years afterward, and despite multiple attempts at transplanting kidneys and other organs, these efforts simply wouldn't work. The cause of rejection came in the 1940s when a London scientist began defining the body's protective immune system, which fought invading infections and infestations and which would also not allow an organ with too many genetic differences to be transplanted from another body. The first example where transplant helped a recipient occurred in 1950 when a cadaver kidney was transplanted, allowing a woman to live a while longer. 
The second, more successful transplant was in 1954. The immune system problem was sidestepped when an identical twin gave his kidney so the dying twin brother could live. And it worked for years. Finally, in the 1960s, we gained some ground after learning about matching for blood transfusions and in a separate vein about turning down the body's immune system using medications originally used as chemotherapy for cancer. Now, with even more advancements, we can successfully transplant hearts, livers, pancreases, lungs, intestines, bone marrows, as well as kidneys. It remains far from perfect, however, with more people in need of organs than are available, with suffering side effects of anti-rejection medicines, and with the tremendous expense of such procedures. Now the problem is when someone should not receive a transplant. The issue is not whether we can do it, it is whether we should do it. When is a person too old, too sick, or too mentally incapacitated for transplant? Advances in transplant science have brought wonderful improvements to the quality of many lives, even saving costs over dialysis. But this all comes with also knowing when to let nature take its course. Margaret Apple from Aberdeen, please give us your phone call, 1-888-376-6225. We want to get that book to you. Uh, or you can connect later uh, by internet. Uh, we want to say a great big thank you to you two for joining us on your own dime uh, to bring this information to people uh, and to traveling to Brookings for our program tonight. Well, it's here, folks. Influenza actively increased to widespread level in South Dakota during the past week. 134 new confirmed cases of influenza were reported last week. 300 confirmed cases cumulative so far this season. 265 influenza A and 35 influenza B with A, H3N2 prevailing. Don't delay. Get your flu vaccine now to reduce your chances of catching the flu bug this season. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc After Hours. We had many great questions submitted beyond what we could answer and technically we didn't get to them as early as we'd like so we need to answer those questions for you. Let's get started. Why does age not matter when it comes to transplanting livers as opposed to other organs? The liver technically doesn't age that much, so an older person's liver will work just as well as a younger person's liver. Uh, we can often tell on biopsy that it's a bit older, it, it shows a little more wear and tear, but when it comes down to the actual function, an elderly liver functions just as well for most patients as so a young one. They talk about liver, I mean, in med school they said it regenerates itself. I mean, there, it's an interesting organ in that sense. It is. If we remove 70% of a normal healthy liver within a few weeks to a month, uh, it's pretty much normal size again. Um, and oftentimes an older liver, when you biopsy an older liver that you put into a younger person, 
looks better on the biopsy a year or two later than it did when you put it in. <laughs> so some of it's environment probably too. Yeah. Uh, what is the most common issue patients come in with to see each of our guests tonight? So Bob, what's the most common problem that you address on a daily basis? Kidney failure. High blood pressure, kidney failure. Wow. Diabetic kidney disease, mm -hmm. obesity. Okay. And Jeff, what is Most your... of my patients are patients from Bob who have kidney failure or liver cancer, liver tumors, bile duct tumors, pancreas tumors. Those are the majority of the patients we see on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. What's the difference between hepatitis B and C, and why is C curable and B less so? Well, both are curable now. Uh, hepatitis B is a DNA virus which uh, incorporates more into the liver cell itself. Um, it can be treated and cured in a lot of patients with uh, medication that's been around for years. Um, hepatitis B, more patients spontaneously cure themselves once you've been exposed. More patients will clear the virus and have antibodies that last the rest of their life. Hepatitis C, far fewer patients who contract it actually clear the virus and are cured. Most keep the virus and it has ongoing damage in the liver. Uh, today the cure rates are almost the same. You can cure almost all patients with hepatitis C today. So today in terms of the cure rates, they're in essence the same. But hepatitis B is easier spread if you didn't know you had it, right, than hepatitis C. Right, hepatitis B can be spread by other, by other mechanisms. Hepatitis C really requires, for the most part, blood, blood. To blood transmission yeah. in one form or another. Uh, since I'm not sure if I have a fatty liver, is there anything I can do to minimize my chances of having a fatty liver? I know a guy who had, and I'm gonna ask you that one too. But. Well, fatty liver uh, really just means there's too many fat globules in the liver. It can be genetic, it can be from medication, it can be lifestyle, obesity, um, diet, diabetes. diabetes, the metabolic syndrome we call it. Um, anybody can have it, uh, and even some people who are very skinny can have fatty livers. Um, so the, the most important thing is if your liver tests are abnormal to investigate it, right. because fatty liver over the course of 20 or 30 years can lead to cirrhosis. Bob, what kind of medication do you uh, have to take post-operatively after a liver or a kidney transplant? Well, for a kidney transplant, we generally have people on three medications, uh, steroids. Like prednisone. Prednisone, at quite low dose by two, two months after five the transplant. Milligram. Five milligrams by two months after the transplant. Prograf or tacrolimus, that's our what, main one. Right, which is what? What is tacrolimus? Uh, it, it's a calcineurin inhibitor. I don't know if you want to know much more than that. <laughs> no. We're um, good to, yeah, but it's an immune suppressing medication. And the third one? Uh, we use it what we would call generally an anti-metabolite, and so the most popular one is mycophenolate or Celsept. Um, and again, an, 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 an immune suppressant medication. And the and PROGRAF, I think, is probably one of the biggest improvements in transplant in the last 15, 20 years in terms of survival. The, <clears throat> its mechanism simply works very well at uh, inhibiting the way one white blood cell talks to another white blood cell when it recognizes a, a transplant. Okay. And it's very specific, mu much more specific than the other drugs we've used. Wow. So uh, who discovered that? I mean, I mean, one little quick word, five words. It's, you know anything? Just like cyclosporin, the old drug, they came from funguses mm -hmm. discovered in Europe oh, as, wow. a, as an antimicrobial that killed other things. So, Wow. Um, is it possible for someone to have cirrhosis of the liver if they take ibuprofen with alcohol? Does ibuprofen and alcohol bring on cirrhosis? No. No. Okay. Uh, what if I'm registered to be an organ donor and had hepatitis A? I'm in remission now, but can I still donate my, my organ? Hepatitis A, is that something that goes no, away? We, we don't even test for it in donors. Generally, it's not a problem because that, That's a temporary type, that type of hepatitis is, almost all, is, is always cleared right. by right. the body, naturally. But I've seen people just turn just orange. <laughs> from it and then right. it goes away and then it's gone. Very, most patients have a pretty, can be pretty sick and get quickly and get better quickly. Occasionally we'll see some people who almost get liver failure from hepatitis A where they're really sick, uh, but almost all of them recover fully with no long-term problems. I had a gentleman come into the hospital at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. 
he got acute fulminant hepatitis and just died right in front of us. I mean, over a period of like four days. It was A, hepatitis? Well, I don't remember what it was. Yeah. I don't remember. What was that B, you think? It would probably B in those or days. Toxin. Probably. It could have been, yeah, it might not have been even a virus. Uh, you know, right after we started the liver transplant program in, in at Mayo Jacksonville, our, our head OR nurse had been in Europe and came down with hepatitis A and almost had to have a transplant. Wow. So That's... you can get pretty severe hepatitis A. But once it's gone, it's gone. When it's too late to donate, when is it too late to donate a kidney? And how old is too old for receiving a kidney? So our cutoff at Avera is 70 for a donor. But the older you get, you have to be in you know, really good shape, health. Every donor has to be healthy, but we're particularly you know, careful about older donors. And then there's no age cutoff for recipients, but you have to be realistic. You know, they have to be uh, in good enough shape to survive a number of years and benefit from the organ. Okay. And one last question, what is alpha-1 in regards to the liver? So alpha-1 antitrypsin is a uh, enzyme that we're born with, um, and its, its um, goal is to balance trypsin. Trypsin breaks down tissue. Antitrypsin inhibits the effect of trypsin. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or abnormalities is a genetic abnormality where antitrypsin is formed, but it's formed in an abnormal shape, so it doesn't work as effectively. So then trypsin is allowed to damage tissues, specifically generally the lungs and the, and the liver are the most common things that we see. In livers it can lead to cirrhosis, and lung it can lead to emphysema and right. lung problems. Well, the question, uh, there is treatment for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Do we have data to say that that treatment effectively stretches lives out and improves things? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, right, it, it hasn't been out long enough to know what its long-term outcomes are. Um, it's been around for a while. Uh, since it's a genetic disease, we've transplanted pe liver transplants for people with alpha-1 antitrypsin for years. They tend to do very well. Uh, I think more long-term data is needed for the medical therapy to prove its effectiveness. There it is. Well, once again, I thank you gentlemen for joining us. This has been wonderful, it's our pleasure. very learning. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all your questions and the opportunity to answer them. So until next time, from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Doc, stay healthy out there, people. That uneasy feeling that can interfere with your social life as well as bring on physical disease, dealing with anxiety, next time On Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. South Dakota State Medical Association. Avera Heart Hospital. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Fishback Financial Corporation. Vance Thompson Vision. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Black Hills Medical Society. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Regional Health, and Swiftel Communications.